Welcome to Behind the White Coat, conversations about science and technology. I'm your host, Carol A. Clark. My guest today is Dr. Terry Wallace. Dr. Wallace is the division leader of the Earth and Environmental Sciences Division at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. He has authored or co-authored more than 80 peer-reviewed publications in many areas of seismology and tectonics including ground-based nuclear explosion monitoring, plate tectonics, regional earth structure, and forensic seismology. He is the co-author of Modern Global Seismology by Lay and Wallace, one of the most widely used textbooks on the topic. We are very lucky to have Dr. Wallace with us today. Dr. Wallace, welcome to the program. Thank you. He's here with us today to talk to us all about the tsunami that hit on December 26th. Let's start with our first question, Dr. Wallace, and that would be, what exactly is a tsunami and are there different types? Well, the word tsunami, first of all, is, comes from a Japanese phrase. It means harbor wave. And uh, it was named by the Japanese to be these very strange kind of waves that came in that they noticed that occurred after earthquakes that could be quite deadly. Um, and it is a special kind of wave. If you go to a swimming pool and the wind's blowing, the waves come across the top of the pool, and you may have water lapping in on the sides of the pool. But that's not what a tsunami is. A tsunami is only the type of wave when you can generate when you move a whole column of water. So in the swimming pool analogy, when you have somebody does a cam cannonball, they push all the water out, and that sends a big wave splashing over towards the sides of the swimming pool. That would be a tsunami, but not the kind of wave that you would get from the wind. So whenever you can displace this big column of water at one time, push it, make a hole, the water has to rush back in, it makes a wave that has to push out through the water and just keep going and going and going. And so it uh, presents a, a challenge for understanding how they act. It depends upon the size of the swimming pool. And it happens to be a geologic disaster which has extremely far-reaching effects. We know from this tsunami at the end of December that um, people died, for example, in Africa, which was thousands of kilometers away. So here you can have a geologic event occur, and then thousands of kilometers away you can have fatalities associated with it. Why was this tsunami so large? Well, this tsunami was, the tsunamis when you have this are just like when I said with the cannonball, you have what we call a local tsunami. So when you're right next to the person doing the cannonball, you get a big wave splashing on you. And that caused a tremendous loss of life right where the earthquake occurred. So um, in the news and most of the deaths that you hear about in Indonesia were in, in Banda Aceh. And there the wave was tremendously tall because this earthquake displaced the seafloor, so this column of water, right there. And so it ran up and was very, very tall because the paddle or whatever you think of this ocean floor moving was so large. Do you know how tall that was right there? Well, the local effects of tsunamis are hard for us to tell exactly how they are. But um, we know that some of the local tsunamis were up to 30 meters, 100 feet tall. Okay, we've seen taller tsunamis uh, historically, locally. Um, there was a um, landslide in Alaska at the turn of the century in which we know generated a local tsunami, a local wave that reached about 500 feet high. Um, but the tsunami after that, the one that generates a long ways away, which we call the teleseismic tsunami, was significant. Obviously killed a lot of people in Sri Lanka, India, and all far away of Africa. But it wasn't that large as compared to some in the past. Dr. Wallace, can you tell me if it was 100, as, as an estimate, 100 feet tall, how fast was it moving? Is there a way to calculate well, that? Well, the way tsunamis work is you, you do think of this as, you know, you do this cannonball and the water rushes back in, and then you have a whole column of water that moves along here. How fast that wave moves, because the whole column from top to bottom has to move, depends upon how deep the swimming pool is. And so when a tsunami is out in the open ocean, where you have a very deep ocean, maybe five kilometers thick, that tsunami moves at a speed of about a jet aircraft. 550, 600 uh, kilometers per hour. So if you were flying from, but um, when you move in this column of water, you have two ways that you can have energy. Think about if you have a baseball, you can throw it really hard, 
So that's our kinetic energy, or you can have to pick it way up here. You pick it up, you have potential energy. Same thing in a tsunami. The height of the wave is the potential energy. How fast it's moving is kinetic. Those two things trade off. As we get close to the shore, the tsunami grows in height, but it slows down. And so once we get to the shore, it's moving much slower and depends on the conditions of the shore on how fast it's running. But it is fair to say that it still travels much faster than you or I could run. So it's not like you could see this wave coming and then you could run away from it. On the other hand, when it strikes the shore, it's not traveling at the speed of a jet airliner either. I see. Now, we've all heard that a tsunami warning could have been issued that would have saved lives. Why wasn't there a warning? Well, first of all, you know, again, there's this local tsunami and then there's this distant tsunami. And it is hard when you have a local tsunami because you have minutes to issue this warning. And uh, you would have had to have the infrastructure. You have to have something to warn the people. You have to have a civil defense authority that knows to look that the earthquake occurred and knows that a tsunami is coming. They simply don't exist in these other places. Then the tsunami that travels across the ocean and strikes Sri Lanka or India, that's two or three hours. So you should be able to do it. You say, hey, a tsunami is coming. But still, you need an infrastructure. You need someone to contact in those countries that says the tsunami is coming. They need infrastructure to communicate with all the local communities and remove the people. So it's a complicated system. The technology is the simple part. The infrastructure. the infrastructure, the civil defense is going to be the hard part. Now our apparatus over here didn't detect what was happening over there. It did, but of course um, there's two ways. We, would, we have a very detailed tsunami warning system for the Pacific. And it has two components. When an earthquake occurs that we think is tsunamigenic, meaning it created a tsunami, um, that earthquake is analyzed and a series of warnings are set up. People aren't warned yet there's a tsunami because we don't know that it created a tsunami. Every earthquake doesn't do that. But we're ready to look for that. And then we have a series of uh, pressure gauges and tidal gauges to measure wave moving out in the open ocean. Once we see that wave moving in the open ocean, we know a tsunami's come. And then we can do the communication to our civil defense authorities. Um, so when the earthquake occurred, we knew this earthquake occurred. We knew it was a monstrously large earthquake. Um, suspected there could be a tsunami. Suspected there could be a tsunami, but we didn't have tidal gauges, and we didn't have things to measure this wave in the ocean, in the Indian Ocean. By the time it gets to our tidal gauges and our pressure gauges in the Pacific, you know, many, many hours have passed. And so even though we could measure it, um, the damaging effects of this tsunami had already passed. How do tsunami warnings work? Well, you just basically explained that. And w w when we realized that there was an earthquake, uh, did we immediately call anybody or we just know that they know there's an earthquake? Well, our tsunami warning system, I mean, when the earthquake occurred, you know, we went through a series of procedures that are normal for this. Um, there is a UN funded organization which is a tsunami information center. It's located in Hawaii and they got the information and they attempted to have a warning. The breakdown really comes from the civil defense infrastructure. Um, they wouldn't have had the details of what the tsunami looked like but it would, they would have been able to do this. But the second half of a warning system that you really have to look at is the human psychology if I told you tomorrow, and you didn't know me from Boo, if I told you tomorrow that we're going to have a comet hit us in Los Alamos, um, you might treat, and you should evacuate and move to Milwaukee, you might treat my warning with great skepticism. The same thing would have probably happened in Sri Lanka or India or even Africa. How, you know, we haven't had a tsunami here from something in, you know, tens or twenties or even hundreds of years, so why should we believe you? So sensitizing the public is one of the most important aspects to any geologic hazard. And I would argue that it would have been very difficult to do in most of those countries anyway. To get them to take the warning seriously. That's correct. I think the, the, the common untrained person thinks this was the largest tsunami ever to hit. It was not. No. I mean, it was a big tsunami. There's no question, especially locally. At Bande Aci, you know, the photos, when we look down, we see these islands, which are quite low. They're only tens of feet above sea level, completely scoured. 
as the water came across. And so it was a big local tsunami. But we've had m very large tsunamis uh, in the past. In this area, if we go back to 1883 when Krakatoa exploded, you know, here's a volcano, exploded, left a big hole. That water rushes in and sent out a tremendous tsunami. And we know that that tsunami in places was much larger than this particular one. 1960, very large earthquake in Chile, the largest one we've ever known about. Uh, created a huge tsunami, killed people in Hawaii, killed people in Japan. Think about the distance from Chile to Japan that you were able to generate a wave that would come across and, and do that. In the 1950s, we had a very large tsunami that had a local effect in Alaska that was about 400 feet high, also killed people in Hawaii. Um, this is an inevitable geologic disaster. And um, it's, it's extremely unfortunate, but it's also fair to say we're going to have many more tsunamis in the future. And the one that hit December 26th, my understanding is it ended up affecting, one way or another, every body of water around the entire planet. Yeah, what happens is the tsunamis, once they travel, this whole column of splash, it just moves out. And um, when you speak to me, it's the same kind of thing that's happening. This You're making noise, it's moving through the atmosphere, but you heat up the air and it bounces off the walls. And so pretty soon you can't hear a person if they're far enough away. Water waves are much more efficient. And so as they move, they spread out but they keep their energy. The only thing that makes their energy go down is the further they spread, the little less their amplitude is. But it's hard to get rid of that energy. So it can be seen in the ocean effects for a long time. Tidal gauges in some of the islands that are now looked at, like uh, Cocos Keeling, um, we can see the wave hit Africa, come back and bounce across the island and hit Australia, bounce after it hits Australia, come back across the island, hit Africa, and bounce back. And you can see this for a number of these bounces back and forth. So it has a very long-lasting effect. Can we learn anything from the tsunami about hazards here in the U.S.? Certainly. This, this uh, tsunami was generated by what we call a great earthquake. Um, earthquakes occur all the time. It's a normal geologic hazard, and we measure them with the magnitude. So we use a s magnitude based on an original scale developed by Richter back in the 30s. We kind of tie everything to back how he saw earthquake size. And this scale is logarithmic. So if we have a magnitude 5 earthquake and we compare it to a magnitude 6, the magnitude 6 has sh ground shaking that's 10 times larger. Um, so this we, what we call great earthquakes are magnitude 8s. They're really big, okay? Well, we expect about one magnitude 8 every year. Sometimes we have two, three, sometimes we don't have any, but on average we have one. This was a magnitude 9 earthquake. They're quite rare. We expect them on, on average about every 25 to 30 years. So this was a very large earthquake. The last time we had an earthquake this big, or bigger, was in 1964 for the Great Alaskan Earthquake. And then in 1960, we had the Chilean earthquake, which is the largest ever, which is 9.6. So let me put the magnitude into perspective. The fault, the thing that broke, that lifted up the water, is about 700 kilometers long. So imagine that this is the paddle generating the wave. It's 700 kilometers long. So between here and well past El Paso, you know, we have this wave that Parts of that paddle during this earthquake, where one, one part of the fault shifted past the other, moved 20 meters, 60 feet. And so you can see how much displacement geologic action was taking place in a matter of a few seconds. And so it was an extremely large earthquake. Could we have anything like that in the U.S.? Well, everybody knows about the San Andreas. We're never going to have a huge earthquake that size on the San Andreas. There's reasons why, you know, geologic reasons why with this fault that comes through California. We could have big ones there, but not in magnitude 9. But we do have a geologic setting that's very similar to Indonesia in the northwest part of the United States. So the volcanoes, we all know about Mount St. Helens erupting and so on back in 1980 and then again this year. Uh, there's a series of volcanoes which mark a plate boundary between North America and a little piece of a plate, a geologic plate we call Juan de Fuca. And that kind of boundary where one's running into the other looks exactly like Indonesia. And that plate boundary runs from the northern California border up into Canada 
and it has very infrequent but probably very large earthquakes. So it looks a lot like what maybe we had in Indonesia. So we should expect someday we may have a magnitude 9 earthquake. We call it the Cascadia earthquake. We think it last occurred around 1700, and the reason we know that is we can see some geologic effects that suggest we had a large tsunami, and we can go find that there was a large tsunami that killed people in Japan in about 1700 that seems to match the kind of wave we would be expected from this. Now, if a nine-pointer were to occur, would it be very possible that a tsunami would incur? And if so, would it head for H- Hawaii or? Sure. Well, if we're going to have, you know, if, when this earthquake comes, not if, but when, it will cause a local tsunami. So we'll have flooding along Oregon and Washington, maybe coming into Puget Sound. We don't know exactly what that wave will look like. And we'll also generate this wave which will cross the Pacific. Now, the travel time, the time it will take to go from Oregon or Hawaii or uh, Washington to Hawaii is five hours. So we may have a tremendous tsunami which strikes Hawaii, but it's unlikely we'll have loss of life associated with that, or much loss of life, because we do have such an effective warning system. But um, it will cause effects that are far-reaching. Our infrastructure is in place. Correct. The news has mentioned that the East Coast might be susceptible to a mega tsunami. What is that? Well, and these are really popular in terms of uh, describing a you know, great geologic disaster. And so in the movies, you've seen things like Deep Impact and these movies in which a comet strikes the Earth and creates a tsunami. And these tsunamis are tremendously large and travel across. The height of these tsunamis is probably exaggerated, but they could be this. One possible way to generate such a tsunami is with a massive landslide. So again, you're displacing water by having a hillside fall off in the ocean. It has to be really big. We know this has occurred in Hawaii over and over, and it's because of the way the Hawaii volcano erupts and it builds itself up, and then it becomes unstable and slides off into the ocean and creates a tsunami. The Canary Islands in the Atlantic look to be similar. They built themselves up and they've collapsed in these um, landslides. Well, they're no longer active volcanically, but it's quite possible we could have this big landslide. And it may create a tsunami over on the East Coast. Uh, and it was, it's a very popular theory. Uh, I think most oceanographers feel like that it's unlikely it would be a really large tsunami. The example would be if you throw a brick into a pool, you get a big wave. You take the same brick but grind it up into dust and then throw it in, you will get a much smaller wave. But the chance of having a tsunami from that is still real. And so it's important, you know, I mean, who thinks of having a tsunami in uh, Miami Beach? Now, a mega tsunami, would you, would you consider the one that hit um, over in Indonesia, in that area, uh, to be a mega tsunami? Well, probably not. You know, when you use the word mega tsunami, they're truly looking for a geologic event, of an event that the tsunami is extraordinarily large. We know that, for example, we think the dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago because of a meteorite impact. And this meteorite impact was on the coast of Mexico in the Yucatan. Half of it was in the ocean. And we know that generated tsunami because we can see tsunami deposits from that date you know, up and down the east coast. We know that tsunami came around and swamped up where New Jersey is today. And so that wave, that even that distant, di- far distance wave probably was on the order of maybe 100 feet. So that's so much bigger than this one. That's what we would call a mega tsunami. The Indonesia earthquake was the largest to occur world- worldwide since 64. Can you explain why now and, and bas- well, you, you've told us how big it was and, and, and wide and long. Uh, why do you think it occurred right now? Well, I think, it, month? again, the, the important thing to look at is that the earthquake is a planet of the Earth is a planet that has tremendous geologic activity. I mean, on our life scales, things seem to occur really slowly. But, you know, the planet's four billion years old, and so these processes are ongoing. We have a very hot planet, and the way we get rid of our heat is to bring the heat to the surface, and that causes these geologic plates to move around. And they're constantly in motion. And so we have earthquakes every year. You know, we have like I said, one great earthquake, one magnitude eight every year. We have 10 magnitude sevens. We have 100 magnitude sixes every year. But um, we don't pay attention to them until they become a social 
event, a Take geologic, lives and right. And so yeah. here we have this event that's not, I mean, it's not that unusual. We have 30 in the last 50 years, but it's so deadly, it really focuses our attention. My God, you know, are we going this period where we have this really big earthquake? And it, it, it is a truly large earthquake. It is a, you know, it's kind of a generational earthquake if you're a seismologist studying it. But on geologic time scales, it's not a rare event. Do you feel there will be a general rise in earthquake activity because of this recent tsunami? Well, certainly in Indonesia, um, what happens when you have this, you're breaking, you know, kind of a boundary between these two plates, and it takes a long time for that readjustment after you break that. So you're going to have what we call aftershocks, and the aftershock time for uh, a great earthquake like this is tens of years. So the earthquake activity in the Indonesian area is going to be elevated. Um, you know, typically they're not nearly as large, but they can be just as damaging because you've already weakened the structures because of the earthquake. Now, will it see a global rise in big earthquakes? We used to say no. We used to say that we look carefully and that we don't see any correlation between earthquakes that occurred in Indonesia and Japan and California. But in the last few years, we've had, we, we've begun to rethink that problem. And um, we're beginning to think that you do see clusters of earthquakes globally. Now that doesn't, we shouldn't be alarmed by that at all. It's just telling us that we don't exactly understand how the earth communicates these stresses, these growing pains that it has. So a really large earthquake in Indonesia, well, may be related to a big earthquake we may see in um, New Zealand over the next few years, or more earthquake activity in South America. Um, but you know, maybe not tomorrow, but maybe in the next few years. And this is an active area of research and one's incredibly fascinating, trying to understand how the Earth does communicate these stresses and, like I said, the growing pains. Since the tsunami, California has been absolutely hammered with rain, mudslides, all of those things. Utah had the avalanche. Uh, I believe Japan had an earthquake. There's been erratic behavior in the weather. Do you feel there's a link between all this? Right. I don't think so. I mean, one of the things that we're focused on when we have this is that when we have events that are coincident in time that are disastrous, we want to always link them. But if we hadn't had the earthquake, we'd be talking about all this weather. Well, let's go back another period of time. We can see lots of weather that occur without an earthquake. Similarly, for the earthquake, we don't have to look at the weather. I don't think there's a connection, but there, what becomes paramount in people's thoughts is that the fragility of the human experience, we're still at the mercy of Mother Nature. And so when we see something like what we call the Pineapple Express that's bringing all these storms from the tropics that come through California, making the snow levels at historic rates of at Tahoe and so on, uh, we want to connect it to everything. But again, they're natural cycles. We have ocean temperatures that control the way this occurs, and then we have this earthquake. They're probably not at all related. But it does remind us that despite our mastery of things like the atom, we think um, Mother Nature still is an incredibly powerful force. And can, can change gears at a moment's notice. Uh, here in the state of New Mexico, um, in speaking with some of the experts down at New Mexico Tech, uh, they indicated with their machinery uh, that um, the earth here in our state actually moved a little bit as a reaction to the... Right. Can, can you tell us a little bit about Well, sure. I mean, when you have an earthquake this big, first of all, I mean, to realize that this earthquake is, is a very large event. If I try to, you know, it's hard to talk about, you know, scales, but we kind of understand energy. And one way to think about energy is how much energy it takes you to boil a little pot of water versus a big pot of water. So you can think about this, if you triple the size of the pot, it takes three times as much heat near that to do that. Well, magnitude nine has, in it, has a um, hundred times as much energy as magnitude eight. Okay, and so you're looking at tremendous increases in, or I'm sorry, a thousand times as much energy. So it was ten times as much shaking, but a thousand times as much energy. So you're looking at an event that is incredible amounts of energy. Okay? And so what this does is it, it's like taking a bell and hitting it really hard. That bell's going to ring. But we can still measure today the earth vibrations associated with this earthquake. 
and uh, it, we will probably be able to do it for months from now. Any um, idea whether an earthquake hazard exists in Los Alamos because we have a, a nuclear laboratory? Well, I think that's, a, I mean, it's a good question. The Earth and Environmental Science Division is charged with evaluating the geologic risk to our nuclear facilities here. And uh, we do have some geologic risk. Um, we live in the mountains. Most of the time, the mountains mean that there's an active geologic process. And the Rio Grande Rift, this deep valley which the Rio Grande flows from uh, the northern borders of New Mexico to El Paso, are, is a fault zone. And so we've seen earthquakes in the past. Uh, I think it would be rare to find a Los Alamos person that hasn't been here for 30 years that hasn't felt a little earthquake. So we do have this, and we do worry about uh, this risk. Uh, the way we try to mitigate that at Los Alamos is to understand that risk as full as we can and build appropriate structures that would withstand the maximum size earthquake that we would expect to see. But it's, you know, it's an always evolving topic. We need to understand the risk all the time and we need to take appropriate measures and we do that. Fascinating. We're out of time, Dr. Wallace. Thank you so much for your expert insight into all of this. I think you've cleared up a lot of questions that many of, of us have had. And thank you for joining us. Please join us again next time for Behind the White Coat.